Uh, today, we are talking about the last three of the minor prophets. You will remember the minor prophets are not minor because they're less important. They're only called minor prophets because they're shorter than the major prophets. The longest of the minor prophets is 14 chapters, whereas Isaiah is 66 chapters. So that's the difference in major and minor. Um, the, the minor prophets generally are in, generally, are in chronological order, which is kind of rare. Again, most of, most of the Bible is, is laid out according to length. You get to the letters of Paul, for instance, the New Testament, it starts with uh, Romans, not because Romans by any means was his first letter, but rather because Romans is his longest. It's also probably theologically the most important. But then, it, you know, we start with Romans and Corinthians, first and second Corinthians, and go down to his, his very short pastoral letters and, and Philemon. So um, here we have a fairly direct chronological layout in terms of, with a few exceptions, like Joel. We're not really sure where Joel was. When he talks about, um, that's the second one listed up here, predicting foreign invasion is God's judgment, he doesn't give us any historical superscription. You remember historical superscription is where it actually says in the text when it was written, usually by referring to who was king or kings during that time period. Joel doesn't say anything about that. We have no other data about Joel. He's not mentioned anywhere else. And so he could be talking about the Assyrian, uh, the coming Assyrian invasion of the uh, northern kingdom of Israel, or he could be talking about the Babylonian invasion of the southern kingdom of Judah. And that's, you know, a difference of 150 years. So somewhere in there. <laughs> um, but but for, apart from a couple of exceptions like that, Joel being the biggest one, we are in chronological order. And the last three of these, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi, are called the post-exilic prophets, as in the title today, because they are um, the prophets that wrote after the Babylonian exile, post-exilic, after the exile. Um, they are the last of the prophetic books, and in fact, they are the last three books of the Old Testament. Malachi, um, who the last of the Old Testament books, it's 450 years before the next prophetic words are spoken, which are by John the Baptist. John the Baptist was, in some ways, the last of the Old Testament prophets, because he's very much in the line and model of the Old Testament prophets. But it had been uh, about 450 years between Malachi and John the Baptist in the New Testament. And that's what's called intertestamental period, where a lot of historical stuff happened. But the emphasis in the post-exilic prophets is on restoration. You will remember that the three great themes in the prophetic books are you've broken the covenant and you better straighten up. If you, ha you haven't straightened up, so judgment is coming. But third, even after the judgment, there will be restoration. Well, because these books come at the end of all of this, you know, the process of history that the prophets are talking about, they emphasize restoration more than anything else. There's a little bit of, you know, you still better shape up in here, but it's mostly a point to the restoration and especially pointing toward messianic restoration where the Messiah will come and will uh, reestablish God's, God's plan on earth. Now, again, you will remember that it was the failure of the people to, to heed the prophets like Jeremiah, for instance, and Ezekiel. The fact that the people, especially Judah, did not listen to the prophets is exactly why the destruction of Jerusalem happened by the Babylonians in 587, 586. Now the Babylonians had actually conquered Judah um, 20 years before that in the late 600s. But because remember we're talking BC, so it works backwards. Um, in, the, in the 605 or so, they had initially conquered. But they actually came back a couple of times after that because of because the Jews kept getting uppity and trying to claim that they didn't want to be under the Babylonians until finally in 586, 587, 586, um, the city and the temple were destroyed by the Babylonians. So it was the failure of the people to listen to the pre-exilic prophets that caused them to go into exile in the first place. And now you have the post-exilic prophets that have come in. Now, the southern kingdom of Judah, the city of Jerusalem, and the temple were destroyed in 586. Um, there was actually a siege that took place beforehand. That's why I say 587, 586. Very seldom do these things happen on a day. Um, the, the exception being the Persian conquering of Babylon. Apparently that happened in one day um, with, with virtually no bloodshed. It was as a judgment against the Babylonians. Anyway, um, 
after the city of Jerusalem was destroyed in 586 and the people are taking off, in, taken off into exile, in 539, so we're talking about approximately 50 years later, um, we have ba the Babylonian Empire conquered by the Persians. And again, read the very end of the book of Daniel because that's the, you know, the, after the, the handwriting on the wall, um, Nebuchadnezzar's grandson, who was sort of ruling regent at the time, Judgment comes on them, and that very night it says his empire was taken away and the Persians took over. Um, well, in 539 BC, the Babylonians are conquered by the Persians under King Cyrus I, Cyrus the Great. The next year, 538 BC, Cyrus issues a decree which allows all the Hebrews to return to their homeland. And it wasn't just the Hebrews. Actually, the Assyrians and the Babylonians both had a policy when they conquered people, they would take them off into exile. The Assyrians pretty much obliterated the, any sense of na nation or people that, that the people they conquered. The Babylonians took the, the southern kingdom of Judah, the Jews from there, off into captivity, but allowed them to still live together. They were all still living together in one place and still had some sense of identity. Even the Jews that were in Babylon, like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they still maintained much of their Jewish identity, whereas the Assyrians would not have allowed that. Well, when the Persians come in, uh, Cyrus has a very different idea as to how to keep, you know, keep the people he's conquered from wanting to rebel. And that is, he gives them a lot of freedoms. Instead of trying to crush them or control them or spread them out so that they can't do anything, Cyrus's approach is, well, I'm gonna, let's work together. And therefore, you will not be, and you'll think I'm a just king, and you will not be inclined to rise up against my empire. So the Hebrews were not the only people that, after Cyrus conquered them, he, as the king of the Persian Empire, said, "You know, you have freedom, worship your religion as you want, and you can go back to your homelands. You don't have to stay in exile." And so, beginning in uh, around that time, over the next hundred years or so, several waves of Jews came back to uh, the Promised Land. Initially, within a few years of the, of the edict from Cyrus that said you can go back to Israel if you want to, there were, the initial wave was probably 50,000 people over a period of time went back to Israel. And they began to rebuild the temple, and then they later, uh, under Nehemiah, you know, read, read the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, they tell this story. Um, under Nehemiah, they actually started rebuilding the city walls. And in a very short order, Nehemiah organized them to rebuild the city walls. Okay. Now, an important point here is while all three of these ex uh, post-exilic prophets talk about restoration, it is not the complete and glorious restoration that God has promised. You know, God throughout the prophets, when He talked about you've broken the covenant, you better repent. If you don't repent, you're going to be judged. But after judgment, there will be restoration. The descriptions of that restoration in the other prophets is this, this glorious, you know, the, the Mount Zion is established as the center of the world and God is there and everyone, all the peoples of the world come there and there's no more <coughs> violence and everything is, you know, it's, it's heaven, that's what it is. Um, this is not that. Now when we say that post-exilic prophets are talking about restoration, there is restoration in the sense that the Jews are allowed to return to the promised land, but they are still under foreign domination. You know, they still have a foreign power, that is Persia, still is over them. They are weak and poor and few compared to what they had been, um, and they're struggling. In fact, we're gonna talk about that when we get into Haggai here, why the people started building the temple and then stopped. But, so there is not a sense in which this is the full-blown glorious Restoration and fulfillment that God had promised. That would not come until the Messiah, okay? The, the, the Davidic king, which is, the, there's, no Dave, there's no heir to David sitting on the throne of Israel. And so the full restoration has not happened in the time of the post exilic prophets. I, I, as I studied this stuff, I was thinking about what, um, what Winston Churchill said after the Battle of Britain. He said, This is not the end, it's not even the uh, beginning of the end, but it is perhaps the end of the beginning. Okay, meaning, there's a long way to go yet, but we've reached a milestone here. Um, that's pretty much where the post-exilic prophets are. The restoration has begun because we're allowed to go back to, you know, we've been allowed to go back to the Holy Land, to the Promised Land. But it is not the, the complete fulfillment. 
this is a this is a perfect example of the prophetic fulfillment. I've talked about this a little bit, but perhaps not specifically enough. Um, in classes we had, uh, like in the life and teachings of Jesus, that Jesus talked about the kingdom of God, and we said that the kingdom of God has to be understood as being already, but not yet. Meaning Jesus said the kingdom of God is in your midst. It meant, he meant him. You know, he, rep he was the embodiment of the kingdom of God, but it is not fulfilled until he returns later. So it's already started, but it's not yet fulfilled. Uh, some people describe it as being uh, the fulfillment of these prophetic statements is sort of, uh, there's a near view, and then there's a far view. There's a short-term fulfillment, but there's a long-term fulfillment. That's very much what it is with the post exilic prophets. There is a short-term fulfillment that is the beginning of the restoration God has promised, but it is far from being the whole glory that God has said is going to happen. That is a much more long-term or far view kind of thing. Does that make sense? And yet we do see the signs of that and the fact that, that the Jews are allowed to return to Israel. Um, so the, the post exilic prophets are actually addressing the Hebrew people at a time in which they're kind of in a middle stage, in between. They're, they're between the beginning of the restoration, but a long time before the final consummation of that restoration. Okay? And that's kind of the setting that we have for that. Any questions about that introduction? Chris? Just, okay, so the, the religious Jews today, yes. obviously they don't think Jesus and Jesus' second coming is going to be the, the restoration. Correct. So they are expecting that it's sometime in the future the Messiah will come and all of that will be fulfilled. Well, uh, the observant Jews are. The fact is the vast majority of Jewish people today are completely secular. You know, they, they, most of them are not even, you know, they're not practicing Jews at all. They're Jews by genetic heritage, not by religious heritage almost. So there are some Jews who still have the expectation of the Messiah. But in the, in the first half of the 20th century, leading up to the founding of the State of Israel in the 40s, um, there was a, a strong move away from the messianic expectation as being what they were looking for and toward the Zionistic expectation of having a nation. Now, both of those things were promised. Um, the, the promise to the Jews was that a Messiah, who was of the lineage of David, would sit on the throne of Israel, and you will, your nation will be reestablished and restored, and then all peoples of the earth will come there. Well, the thing is that the waiting for the Messiah, Messiah got old for that. Okay? He's not here yet. We don't know when he's coming. We don't really... And, and two, you have to understand that they, they lost a sense of the Davidic line in a great, to a great extent. And so the focus started being much more on the Zionistic expectation, the expectation that the nation of Israel would be reestablished. And then in the late 40s, when it actually happened, who cares about the Messiah anymore? We've got our country back. Okay? Mm. Um, and that's true for... The thing is that waiting on the Messiah requires a religious commitment. Okay? There's much more of a religious aspect of that. You can have a completely secular, geopolitical kind of orientation toward being a Jew and, and have a Zionistic uh, goal and see the fulfillment of that in the founding of the nation of Israel. So Zion, the idea of looking for Zion, which is, is, means the restoring of the nation, um, requires virtually no religious commitment at all. And so it's much easier when Jews have become so secular anyway. Um, and, and that is, I think, but again, observant Jews would say the Messiah is still coming. I mean, observant Jews still maintain an Elijah chair. You know what that is? You know, when you have Seder suppers and, and whatnot, and you maintain an empty chair, the promise is that Elijah is coming back. And that when Elijah comes back, he will be the forerunner to, you know, to, to tell of the coming of the Messiah, you know, the descendant of David. That's why John is called Elijah. Okay. Well, obviously, observant Jews don't think of John the Baptist was Elijah, but they, observant Jews, still maintain Elijah's chair because they expect that, that the prophet Elijah is coming back to tell of the, you know, the imminent coming of the Messiah. Okay. So there is still that expectation amongst observant Jews. Yes? Were any of the Jews left in Israel after the third exile? Yes, uh, there were still Jews there. In fact, um, they, the Babylonians specifically left people to work the land. I mean, they didn't want it to completely, you know, go to seed. Uh, yeah, so the poor farmers. Yes, some of the poor farmers were left there. There were people still there. Um, there, the Samaritans especially were still around. I mean, which were half Jews, uh, you know, or 
or mixed Jews, uh, because the Samaritans are one of the groups that give so much trouble when the, the Jews come back from Babylon and start trying to rebuild the temple. Okay, um, they actually the Samaritans offered to help, and the Jews said, "We're not going to let you help." And so that was another thing that created such a hard, uh, uh, such hard feelings between the Samaritans and the Jews, which maintained its. Those hard feelings were still there 450 years later when Jesus comes around. Okay, um, so there were Jews and partial Jews and whatever that were still there, but not a significant population, and they were scattered. They didn't have a center like Jerusalem had given. So, center. how many people, uh, uh, Jews totally, were in exile to Babylon? I don't have a number. Um, I could probably find out. I don't even know if we have exact numbers. I mean, a lot of people were like killed. A million or two? Um, I, believe, I don't know. I mean, a great many were killed. I, I don't think a million because I don't think the population was really that much. Even though supposedly there were millions that came out of Egypt, I think I don't think anybody, virtually nobody, accepts that as being a valid number. Because if that had been the truth, the case, then there wouldn't have been an army anywhere in the world that could have stood up to the Israelites if they had a million men under arms, which is a suggestion. You know, that would be fine. Uh, anyway, I, I don't I don't have an answer for you. I could, I could perhaps <coughs> find out. But the only thing that was left behind is just scatterings of you know, <coughs> on disorganized and rural kinds of things. But there was no longer any sense in which there were enough people there to constitute a nation. Okay. Um, again, we've looked at this several times, this chart, which I find very valuable. You will notice Daniel and Ezekiel, this gap right here between 586 and 536, that is the exile. And Daniel and Ezekiel spoke to the exile, or during the period of the exile. This line is when the Jews from 536 on, under the Persian Empire, you'll notice these, these things line up, mm -hmm. under the Persian Empire, they were allowed to return to Judah. That's when Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi speak. All right? You see how this lays out. That's why they are post-exilic, because this is the exile. That's when Daniel and Ezekiel were writing. Both Daniel and Ezekiel were carried off into exile at different times. Daniel among the young nobles of, his, of uh, Israel, and to in order to be raised in the house of Nebuchadnezzar, and to or in, that is in the city of Nebuchadnezzar, and to be trained to be part of his court. And Ezekiel was carried off in exile, and he was with the exiles living together south of Babylon, um, and and writing about and to the people of, uh, of Judah, uh, of Jerusalem rather, because he was exiled before Jerusalem was destroyed. And he was there in exile, Ezekiel, when Jerusalem was destroyed, so he writes about that. But these three, that guy, Zechariah and Malachi, um, are post-exilic during the time of the Persian Empire. <coughs> okay? Now, Persian Empire. This is the Persian Empire. Yeah. The Persian Empire was definitely one of the great empires of history. Uh, exceeded, in terms of scope, probably only by the Romans, um, because the Romans had much more of Europe. And uh, Alexander the Great, you know, Alexander the Great conquered every place, but then he died before he could very much turn it into an empire. His generals sort of did, but then they had their own, they broke it up into their own thing. But to give, in case you have trouble picturing this, this is Israel right here. They've got the cities of Tyre and Sidon, for some reason not Jerusalem on here. This is Egypt with the Nile River. This is uh, Asia Minor, which is modern day Turkey. This is Greece, it says Greece. Uh, here, and you'll notice that the, the Persians conquered this northern area of Macedonia. They actually, at various times, they attacked Athens and lower Greece, but never controlled it. The fact that the Persians did this was what ticked uh, Alexander the Great's father, Philip of Macedonia, off and, got, and had him preparing an army to go back and conquer Persia. And he died, was assassinated, and his son, uh, Alexander, took the army and started a march that, that he left and crossed over, conquered Asia Minor, you know, conquered all the way down into Egypt, came back <coughs> up, went over here, you know, went to India, got all the way to India, and wanted to go to the ocean, and his, his, after 10 years, his troops were saying, Al, 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 can we please go all <laughs> you know, and they refused to follow him any longer. Um, and then he, coming, as he was coming back, he decided he was going to establish his, his, the center of his kingdom, in Babylon, and he was there a relatively short time before he died. Okay, but you get the idea. Again, this is Persia, which is what all of this is called. The capital of Persia was here in Susa. If you read the book of Esther, 
it takes place in Susa because Esther was a wife of one of the kings of Persia, right? But it goes all the way over here into the Indus Valley, which means it too came over all the way into India, what we know as India. The Hindu Kush is, is Afghanistan. The Hindu Kush are the mountains in Afghanistan that have always been a problem for everybody. Alexander was almost unique in his ability to conquer Afghanistan and cross the Hindu Kush mountains, okay? Um, ask the Russians and the British before them, you know, what it's like to try to fight there. Um, and us. Um, so, you get the idea. This was the scope of the Persian Empire. Now, Babylon, this was Babylon, which was the capital of Babylonia, and this was where the Babylonian Empire had been. Now, it had been, it didn't come quite as far um, east as this, but the Babylonian Empire had been close, and it didn't get over into Greece, but it was very significant, too. Uh, not quite as large as the Persian Empire. And again, when the Romans, the Romans didn't get over this far, but they did conquer all of this, and all the way over here, you know, since they started in Europe, they started in Rome, in Italy, then they conquered all the way to Britain. They conquered from, from Great Britain all the way to around here. All right, so the Roman Empire was larger in that regard. Questions about that? So you got a visual, right? Yes? The sea that is not um, identified next to the Caspian Sea? Yes. Do we know what that is? Yes, we do. Um, ah! <laughs> It's in Russia now. Yes. No, no Black Sea's here. Black Sea is connected to the Mediterranean. Um, what? No, Caucasus is are mountains. Uh, let me think about it. Okay. Yes, sorry, look up at the break. I can't believe I can't think of what that is because it's a major body of water. In fact, I think it's the one that the Russians from Stalin on basically just let die for industrial reasons. Um, it's the largest. And I hope it's coming back now, but it was the largest dead body of water in the world at one point. Um, because they just said, oh, we need industry. Let's, who cares? The waters can't support life. Why was Alexander the Great uh, so successful? Um, because he thought he could. <laughs> I'm going to be teaching, and Alexander the Great is one of the absolutely most fascinating characters in history. And he was convinced, and it was actually affirmed, down here, um, so you don't have a map. Out in the desert, there is there was an oracle, and when Alexander the Great showed up in Egypt and conquered it very quickly, they declared him a god. Well, that wasn't that uncommon because the pharaohs were considered divine. All right, so the ruler was considered divine. Well, he went out to this oracle, and the oracle declared him that to be the son of Zeus. Well, there had been a legend that um, Philip wasn't actually his father, but rather that his mother had had relations with Zeus, the god, and so Alexander was the offspring of Zeus, and Alexander started believing that himself, I think, and he believed he could win. It's also true that he was very successful because his father had done such an extraordinary job creating an army that was very disciplined, very loyal, very committed. Uh, Alexander um, revolutionized, well Philip first, and then Alexander revolutionized the use of cavalry. And I think, it, as I've mentioned before, they believe, it's not a fact, we don't know it as a fact, but, but we believe that that may have been the point at which the stirrup was introduced to saddles. Which meant Alexander's troops may have been the first army ever to have stirrups on their horse, on their saddles. Can you imagine how much more effective you would be fighting a battle if you had stirrups versus if you didn't? Sometimes it's the little things. Um, and he, I mean, he regularly defeated armies that were five times his size. He was, as a strategist, he was brilliant. They still teach uh, the battles of Alexander for strategic reasons at West Point and other military academies because he was extraordinary in terms of having a natural sense of being able to evaluate the terrain, evaluate the positioning of the other army, and make immediate decisions as to how to defeat them. And he never lost a battle. Alexander was never defeated in battle, ever. Amazing. And he fought from there, here, here, you know, and back again, never got defeated. Right? Mike? One of the secrets was the Greek phalanx that had been developed by well, that's true. There were other strategic, strategic things besides the, the cavalry, which he used to great effect. He also um, 
had a, a phalanx, which was a, you know, a, the way he organized his body of soldiers, which later got adopted in a, in a modified form by the Romans. It was one of the things that made the Romans so very effective in war. It, it, prior to that, there used to be the idea that you just line people up in one or two lines and rush at each other and see who wins. Well, the discipline, I mentioned discipline, the discipline of the Macedonian army under Philip and is that they had units that were sort of in blocks that he could move around where he wanted to and as they moved forward they had particular discipline as to how they, they moved and arranged themselves and they would just punch holes through these lined up armies of other, other places. I mean he even defeated the armies of, the, of one of the kings in India that had war elephants. You know, he, they beat elephants, for heaven's sake. Uh, okay, that's enough about that. <laughs> I, you can tell I'm interested. Yes. Uh, just right. quickly, did you see the movie Alexander and mm -hmm. was it fairly accurate? Well, yeah. It was, I, I mean, I, I don't remember the specifics of it at this point, but I think it was fairly accurate. There have been a number of movies about Alexander. I assume you're meaning the one with, with the, the Irish guy. No, yeah. Oh, yeah. Colin Farrell. Yeah. yeah that's right. um, I think it was probably fairly accurate, but I'd have to look at it more closely. I wasn't thinking about that when I watched it. So, Okay, let's move forward. The book of Haggai. Haggai, the prophet, uh, we have a very specific date because he starts out by saying that he is writing in the second year of King Darius. Now, Cyrus, was Cyrus the Great was the one that defeated the Babylonians and took over um, the Babylonian Empire and created that, that thing you saw, that huge map. Um, later on, Darius I became king, you know, like 19 years later. And Darius, uh, also called the Great, Darius the Great. Now, there's a little confusion because if you read in Daniel at the end, it says the kingdom was conquered by Darius. Well, Darius wasn't the first, he was not king when when Babylon was conquered. Either Darius was the name of one of the generals who was leading the army that defeated the Babylonians, or it was a um, one of the one of the other names for Cyrus. You know, kings tended to have a lot of names, and depending upon different different names were used by different people. One of those two things is true because Darius was not the king when the Babylonians were destroyed. But 19 years later, actually uh, 17 years later, he took over. And so we know exactly when Haggai was, was writing. In fact, Haggai, we know exactly the exact dates. It's from August to December of the year 520 BC. In fact, we actually have day dates. It's like August 9th to December 20th or whatever, but I don't use those because I'm not sure exactly how, exactly how that can be. Um, but one of the things that starts out, as we'll see in a second with Haggai, is as he introduces the, his prophecies, he starts out with identifying, giving a historical superscription, giving us an exact date, and then, again, his writing takes place over only four month period of time, and he tells us what that is. Um, that means he starts out with an acknowledgement of the fact that the Persians are in, are, have dominion or have control over the Israelites. So even in the superscriptions that we have here and in Zechariah, there's an acknowledgement that the great fulfillment has not occurred or is not occurring yet because there still is somebody else who's controlling, who has power over the Israelites. Um, now in 536, this is two years after the initial decree by Cyrus, a fairly large group of Hebrew exiles had returned to Jerusalem and they didn't all go at once. I mean, it's not like they got thousands and thousands of guys who marched over there together. Um, you even, if you read Nehemiah, you'll hear that his Nehemiah's brother comes back and reports how it's going, and that inspires Nehemiah. The Spirit uses that to inspire Nehemiah to want to go and rebuild the walls. But So you had some traffic back and forth. But in 536, the first Hebrew exiles, two years after Cyrus gave the decree that allowed them to go back, they returned to Jerusalem and they began constructing the temple. Haggai writes 16 years later, and all of the work on the temple had stopped. The temple was not complete. But the work had stopped because they had been opposed by local peoples. There were bandits that were coming in and harassing them and attacking them and, you know, taking their bags of concrete and all that kind of stuff. And they were having trouble moving forward. That was a joke. They didn't actually have bags of concrete back then. Make sure you understand that. Um, so they, uh, they stopped. And so Haggai, in 520, is writing to them to, to challenge them to get on with it. You know, get back to rebuilding the temple. 
And he exhorts them then not only to rebuild the temple, but also to pursue right worship of Yahweh. There's four sections. There's, in the, there's only two chapters of Haggai. Um, the completion of the temple is encouraged. Then there is the, a, a description, actually, they acknowledge the fact that the new temple that's being built is pretty lame compared to the old temple. Um, in fact, it says, when you look at it, doesn't it seem like nothing? <laughs> Uh, but God promises them, because they've been faithful, that there will be future glory to the temple. And actually, 500 years later, or not quite 500 years later, 450 years later, Herod the Great takes it upon himself in order to try to win <coughs> favor with the Jews. Again, Herod was not Jewish. He was Idumean. He was basically Arabian. Um, he, Herod the Great, rebuilt the temple, and the glory of that temple was so great. Josephus says that unless you've seen that, you know, Herod's temple, as it was called, or the second temple. Unless you've seen Herod's temple in Jerusalem, you haven't seen a beautiful building. Um, and so later, it did have all of the glory that the previous temple. And now remember, Solomon had built the first temple. That's the temple that the Babylonians destroyed. Now, the Jews have gone, gone back to uh, Jerusalem. They're rebuilding the temple under Ezra. And that's what Haggai is talking about, is to say, get on with it. Um, and they built a fairly modest temple, shall we say, which then over a period of time they, they kept adding to and, and making it more, more glorious. And then Herod came along and really made it quite something again. That was the second temple. And in fact, when you study history, they'll talk about the first temple period, which means Solomon and the time from, between Solomon and the destruction of uh, the temple by the Babylonians in 586. And the second temple period, which is from here until the Romans destroyed that one in AD 70. Okay, got that? So you'll read First Temple, Second Temple periods. That means that the time when the Temple of Solomon was up was the First Temple uh, period. The time when the temple that's being talked about here was built by the Jews and then later you know, uh, made much, much more significant by Herod. All right? Let's look at the text. In the second year of King Darius, there you have it. And we know that King Darius became king in, in 522 B.C. So, because we have those historical records. So we know exactly what we're talking about. On the first day of the sixth month, so we do have a specific date, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Josadak, the high priest. So Zerubbabel is the governor, Joshua is the high priest. Those are the two primary officers to the Jews that are now living in Jerusalem. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house. Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. It is time for you yourselves, uh, I'm sorry, is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house, that means the temple, remains a ruin? Now this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much, but harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but are not warm. You earn wages, only to put them in a purse with holes in it. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build my house, so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. You expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why, declares the Lord Almighty, because of my house, which remains a ruin while each of you is busy with your own house. Therefore, because of you, the heavens have withdrawn, withheld their dew and the earth its crops. I call for a drought on the fields and the mountains, on the grain, the new wine, the olive oil, and everything else the ground produces, on people and livestock, and on all the labor of your hands. Okay. God speaks through Haggai and says, you guys are all occupied. Your houses are really nice. Paneled houses was a sign of luxury to take wood, wood and to be able to cut it into pieces that you panel your house, that was not nearly as easy back then as it is now. You didn't go to Home Depot and just buy some paneling. And so God, speaking through Haggai, is saying, you guys are living in these great houses quite luxuriously, and yet my house is a ruin, and you stopped working on it. And more than that, he says, have you ever wondered why you're not getting much production out of your crops? Why you never seem to have enough to eat, even though you eat a lot. Why it is you drink but never have your fill. Your clothes don't seem to keep you warm. You seem to be making uh, money, 
but it's all gone before you know. You put it in a purse with holes in it. That's what that means. Where does it all go? In other words, God has not allowed them to succeed, has not, has not blessed them, has not allowed them to be prosperous in any of their activities. Why? Because they are focused entirely on their own stuff and their own houses and their own well-being and have completely forgotten about, forgotten about building the house of the Lord. By the way, I'm going to be preaching from this when it comes time for us to raise more money for our new church. <laughs> I think it's a beautiful example. Yes. God very specifically says, if you want to be more successful in life, you've got to put me first. You have to put my house first. You spend a lot of time and money and effort on your own house, on your own stuff. You're paying the consequences for that by not paying attention. So the people are struggling um, because they're more concerned with their own things than they are with the things of God. And they cancel the plans to rebuild the temple. Okay, the house of God. That's when it says this house, it means because they saw the temple as the house of the Lord. That's where we get the expressions we use today, the house of worship. You know, the church is the house of God. It comes from the references to the temple in the Old Testament. We don't believe, and now the Jews actually believe that God lived in the temple, the original temple. And we read in Ezekiel when God left because of the disobedience of the Jewish people and in advance of the temple being destroyed by the Babylonians. God was not going to be there when that happened. He left and took his Shekinah, his glory, the glory of his presence, or Shekinah, um, out of the temple when it was destroyed. Now, interestingly enough, even though they do rebuild the temple, we never have an account of the glory of God returning to the temple the way it was before. Okay. All right. And you guys are going to ask me questions if you have any questions about that. So, further down the road, when uh, Jesus came, he would preach to the multitudes on, from a rock or wherever. Mm -hmm. He didn't need a house. Right. In fact, so he didn't have a house. why today do we have these monstrosities of, of churches being built that seem to be more to the glory of of the people than they do right. to, to God. I mean, that, that is a conflict for me. Well, and I, I can't defend that. <laughs> I mean, um, we're building a church, but it's not going to be with gold and silver and you know precious stones. And we're building a church so that we have more room for people to worship in and more room for us to have service to others, you know, to have uh, places where we can teach more, places where we can uh, have services where we're training women to help care for the family, you know, care for the families, job skills, um, where we can have a place, places of fellowship so that people can gather for that. So, yeah, I mean, we're building a church, and compared to what we have now, it's going to be a big church, but it's not going to be very glorious. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure that most of you have owned houses that are going to cost more than what our church will be by the time it's done, even though it's going to be many times larger than most of your houses. So, in terms of why do churches do that, I think a lot frequently it is. I, I think that from time to time they have, people have done it because they really did feel we want to build something glorious to the glory of God. I, I don't want to deny the fact that some people have had that motivation. I think it's also fairly true that there are some, some individuals in churches who have done it because they wanted to be the biggest church in town. I mean, they want to be big and glorious and all that. Uh, I want to be the biggest church in town, but not because I want to have a big building. It's because I want to be able to minister to as many people as possible. You know, if you don't care about numbers, then you don't care about people. Um, but, yeah, I, I, I can't defend it because I don't understand it either. I used to say, this is the house of my father. It's mm -hmm. Jesus' house. Exactly. He did not say it was his house. In fact, he said that the Son of Man, you know, foxes and birds have trees, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. You know, he did not have a home as an adult. Um, it doesn't say building, you know, having a church is wrong. The early church started as house church. But... Fairly soon, it wasn't practical to meet in homes anymore because they had too many people, and so they had to start having facilities especially for that. That's how churches started. And again, if that's the focus and the orientation, then it's a good thing. If the idea is we want to show, we want to be showy, no, that's not what we want. Okay? Anything else? Uh, continuing with Haggai, verse 12, the good news is the people listen. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, again, he was the governor over these people, the one that was commissioned, he was given the governorship by the, the Persian king. Joshua, son of uh, Josadak, who was the high priest, 
um, says the high priest. And the whole remnant of people, remember the remnant, even though many, even most of the people had been killed or driven off, there always was a remnant, a small number of people that stayed true to God. The whole remnant of the people obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the message of the prophet Haggai because the Lord their God had sent him, and the people feared the Lord. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, gave this message of the Lord to the people. I am with you, declares the Lord. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, son of Josedek, the high priest, and the spirit of the whole remnant of the people. They came and began to work on the house of the Lord Almighty, their God, on the 24th day of the sixth month. So they listened, and they obeyed, and they went to work on the house. And God said, as you respond in that way, I am with you. This is not just you. You're not doing this on your own, by your own power or anything else. And later on, God is very specific. The issue of the temple also comes up in Zechariah, not as, not as specifically as Haggai. Um, in fact, it's astonishing how limited the message of Haggai is, even for two chapters. It's very clear. Build God's house and worship Him. Period. That's what this is all about. Okay. Now, here's where we get the part about the, the, this temple not being nearly as grand. In the second year of King Darius... Um, or Darius, Darius is how it's often pronounced in, in scholars, again, 520 B.C., on the 21st day of the seventh month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai, speak to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, to Joshua, son of Josedak, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people. Ask them, who of you is left who saw this house in its former glory? Who remembers what the Temple of Solomon looked like? How does it look to you now? Does it not seem to you like nothing? But now be strong, Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Apparently there are other, other traditions that say the people, when they saw what it was looking like, they were weeping because it seemed so puny and insignificant. Be strong, Joshua, son of Josedak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord, and work, for I am with you, declares the Lord Almighty. This is what I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, and my spirit remains strong among you. It remains among you. Do not fear. This is what the Lord Almighty says. In a little while, I will once more shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. I will shake all nations, and what is desired by all nations will come, and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord Almighty. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, declares the Lord Almighty. The glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord Almighty. And in this place I will grant peace, declares the Lord Almighty. God is promising, even though it doesn't look like much now, if you are faithful, which you are being faithful, I, in the future, will create this place to be more glorious than you can imagine. In fact, when he says, um, I will shake all nations, and what is desired by all nations will come. I will fill this house with glory. There's another place where he says, I will bring people from afar to help finish building this. Well, that's what Herod did. I think this is a prophetic word from God through Haggai that he will bring somebody else to come in to make this glorious, even more glorious than Solomon's original effort, because you all are being faithful to build the basic thing. Okay? And it will have silver, and it will have gold, God says, because those things are mine. And when the time is right, I'll provide them. The Jews were poor at this point. They, they had been exiles. They didn't have anything. They, you know, they came here, basically started out with nothing, not even a place to live, and they start building the temple. They, well, they also built themselves very nice houses, but they were poor people. They didn't have the resources of a king like Herod or like, you know, the Persian king or anybody else who could provide for them. Now, in Nehemiah, we find out that Nehemiah, because he'd been an assistant to the king of Persia, ended up getting materials donated by the king. But at this point in the building of the temple, they're struggling, and they don't have materials to make it spectacular. But God says, you're doing what I ask, you're working with what you have, I will bless that, and it will become glorious. Okay, Ron? I think it helps explain church construction. Yep. Glory of the Lord. Yeah, that's the whole point of it. You know, when you look at this and you and you compare it with contemporary um, goals to build huge churches, like we talked about, and some some build them with a pure motive, and some build them with you know to look at me and that sort of thing. 
When you look at this, it's amazing to see how these people who were disheartened, disenjoined, they were just upset, they were thrown in the town, and something's of such brevity. I mean, this is not very long. Such a brief word from God alivened the people, awoke the people to right. do something. There was not this cheerleading uh, from, from the pulpit that some would engage in. Yeah. There's a difference between explaining the strategy that we right. know. I, I realize that. But it's also uh, true that not everybody's always responsive like they were. Well, exactly. But, but some, <laughs> Sometimes you have to make the point more than once, is what I'm saying. <laughs> but not everybody makes the argument with the anointing of God like this prophet did. That's the point I'm making. When, when God speaks, to his people, there is an awakening you know, that takes place, and that's quite striking. Yeah, I can promise you, though. I mean, we're we're getting off into modern church issues. That um, any minister who gets up today and preaches and says, "If you do not give money to build the house of the Lord, your wages aren't going to go far enough. You're not going to have enough to eat. Your crops are going to fail." You know, how do you think modern audiences would respond to that? Right. Right. And yet, that's what the word says. Okay, so it's a it's a job. Uh, but you're right. I mean, it, Haggai. It's like when Jonah preached in, in Nineveh. You know, preach once, and everybody goes, "You're absolutely right." The Spirit convicts them. They say, "Yes." Well, that's what happened with with the, the remnant that was in Jerusalem at this time. Okay. And in this place, I will grant peace. Again, some of these ancient traditions were were carried forward. This is one of the reasons why in cathedrals. In you know in Europe later on well throughout the world but in Europe especially they were places of refuge you know um, Hunchback in Notre Dame the whole story of the or Notre Dame if you want to pronounce it correctly um, the whole story there is that a young gypsy woman who's being pursued by the police goes into the cathedral and they can't go in there to get her they were places of refuge a place of peace you couldn't go in there and arrest someone and that's where she meets the Hunchback who's the bell ringer. Matimoru, Matimoru, Notre Dame. Okay. Um, this idea that the cathedral, the, the house of God, is supposed to be a place of peace. And so you don't arrest people there, etc. Okay? Alright, keep going. Um, Haggai 2. Now, give careful thought to this from this day on. Consider how things were before one stone was laid on another in the Lord's temple. When anyone came to a heap of 20 measures, there were only 10. Now, what God is saying here is he's reminding them again. Now, don't lose heart, because remember what I told you before. You per, your personal life is not successful unless you, unless you put the Lord first. He's reiterating that. When anyone went to a wine vat to draw 50 measures, there were only 20. I struck all the work of your hand with blight, mildew, and hail, yet you did not return to me, declares the Lord. From this day on, from this 24th day of the ninth month, very specific days, give careful thought to the day when the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid. Give careful thought. Is there yet any seed left in the barn? Until now, the vine and the fig tree, the pomegranate and the olive tree have not borne fruit. So he's saying prior to you guys committing to build a temple and put yourself to it, nothing was working out for you. But then he ends it, verse 19, from this day on, I will bless you. So God did not allow them to be successful in any of their endeavors until they recommitted themselves to the house of God and therefore to worshiping and glorifying God. And then he says, from this day on, I will bless you. Now there's a little bit more in chapter 2, which I don't have a slide for, but basically... Um, Haggai, at the very end, he looks forward to the Messianic age. He talks about on that day, for instance, in chapter 2, verse 23, and he talks about signet ring representing a ruler. And that it's not going to be a signet ring, you know, the one who, the signet ring was used to seal commands to, to and that there is going to be uh, the ultimate, the final signet ring, one of the ultimate rulers, the Messiah. So the end of Haggai is a Messianic prediction, okay? And that's Haggai. Again, very simple point. Build God's temple and worship Him. And if you don't, things are not going to go well with you. If you do, God will bless you. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. Yes, Marvin? 
well, we, our purse is empty and our barns are empty and, and we haven't got anything to give to God, so why doesn't he give it to us first and then we will? <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's an awful bless problem. me and I will bless. Uh, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's not the way it works. No, I know. <laughs> yeah, that's the widow in her mind. Yeah. <laughs> All right, now we come to Zechariah. The name Zechariah, uh, I'm going to get started on this, we'll probably break in the middle of the table. Zechariah, the name means Yahweh remembers. And the book of Zechariah, which is one of the longest of the minor prophets, okay, Zechariah is 14 chapters, um, which makes it one of the longest, in fact, I think it's equal to the longest of the minor prophets. Um, the, the theme of this book could pretty much be identified as Zechariah's name, Yahweh remembers, because the theme is that God has remembered and will remember, even in a greater way even, his people and his promises to his people. So that's the theme of this. Of this. Uh, I said here the purpose was to encourage the completion of the temple as a symbol of a blessed messianic fu future. So the Messiah is a strong theme in here. Um, there is a strong emphasis on salvation with, with the messianic focus. Okay, um, All three of the prophets, the post-exilic prophets, that is, um, are more oriented toward salvation, restoration, God's blessing, than they are judgment. You know, that came earlier. But there's a little bit of that in there, in here, in terms of you do have, to, you do have to, to shape up people. But most of it is oriented toward salvation and restoration. Uh, Zechariah is very future-oriented. He's talking about the Messiah. He's talking about future blessing. More than most of the prophets. Most of the prophets do not deal as much with the future as right now. You know, you read them. Uh, Isaiah, Je uh, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, even the minor prophets. They're saying, hey guys, you're acting bad now. Straighten up now. Zechariah is talking about almost, not entirely, but mostly about what's coming in the future. Okay? And exhorting the people to repentance, although the, it's restoration. He does have a little exhorting to repentance and obedience there. But, and, and there's a very strong social theme in Zechariah. The idea that you do have to care for the widow and the orphan and that sort of thing you, you, if you want to be blessed by God. Now you'll notice 520 was the date that we had for Haggai. So Haggai and Zechariah are contemporaries. They are during the same period of time. Um, you always wonder whether these guys go out for coffee, right? You know, they're, they're prophets at the same time period. And there are, there, there are others as well during that. Uh, the outline, there are three large sections. It starts out, the first six chapters deal with eight visions that, uh, and we're going to go through those, eight visions that are given to Zechariah, each of which has a symbolism. Then there are four core messages, and then it ends, the chapters 9 through 14, the last five chapters, deal with two burdens, or oracles. The word that's translated uh, oracle and the word that's translated burden in Hebrew is the same word. So there are a, a burden to bear that you're speaking to in terms of an oracle. Um, and those two, those two oracles or burdens are first the advent and rejection of the coming Messiah. And then the second is the advent and accept, eventual acceptance of the coming Messiah. So these two burdens or oracles are very messianic to finish out um, Zechariah. The, the real focus, the, the purpose of Zechariah in many ways, you could say, is to reorient the post-exilic community. Remember, this group of people have really suffered in terms of, they went through a period of time, in fact, when we, went, we, when we did a survey, the survey class, I talked quite a bit about the effect that the Babylonian uh, captivity and exile had on the Jewish people. They thought they were the chosen people of God, and God had demonstrated that by giving them a land by giving them a temple where God actually lived in their midst. First it had been the tabernacle in the wilderness, but then when they got to Jerusalem and Solomon built the temple, God actually lived there. He was their God, they were his people, and, you know, this was, this was how it should be. Well now, their land has been taken away from them, their temple has been destroyed, God's presence has been removed, and the Jews were left saying, what do we do now? In fact, what are we now? Is does God hate us? Are we no longer the people of God? How are we supposed to worship him without a temple since their worship was oriented around the sacrificial system? In fact, that's where the synagogue system really got going. You know, there had been some sort of houses of prayer, 
before, but the idea that synagogues gave the Jews a place to gather for study and for prayer and for fellowship, because one of their other concerns was that they were going to lose a sense of community, what it meant to be a Jew, because they were going to be broken up. All of those things were part of what the synagogue system did. But the, the context here is that the Jewish people, after uh, during and at, up until this time, of the post-exilic time, um, they were still trying to figure out how, what does it mean to be Jewish again. And so Zechariah is one of the, the key uh, prophets that's trying to reorient the Jewish people back to a sense of expectation that God will bless, he will restore, he will fulfill his promises. Because they've just gone through 50 years of believing that that wasn't true anymore. Does that make sense? That's what Zechariah really is trying to accomplish, I believe, is to get them reoriented back around to understand that God has not completely deserted them even though it sure felt it like it and looked like it. Um, and again, as I mentioned before, like Haggai, Zechariah is concerned about the rebuilding of the temple, um, but he emphasizes it as being a first step toward a larger future. Again, he's very future-oriented. He says, okay, build the temple now, because he's contemporary of Haggai, but there's a future. This represents a future of restoration. Okay? Let's look at the text of Zechariah. In the eighth month of the second year of Darius... Second year, 520, same, same year as Haggai. The word of the Lord came to the prophet Zechariah, son of Berechiah, the son of Edu. The Lord was very angry with your ancestors. Therefore, tell the people, this is what the Lord Almighty says, return to me. The word here in Hebrew is shuv, which is the same word that gets translated repent. Because repent, shuv in Hebrew, metanoia in, in Greek, literally means to turn and go in the other direction. Which makes sense. To repent means to stop doing, stop going the way you're going and turn around and go the other way. So he's saying, return to me, literally repent, and come back toward me. Stop going in the wrong direction, declares the Lord Almighty, and I will return, shuv, to you, says the Lord Almighty. Do not be like your ancestors, to whom the earlier prophets proclaimed, this is what the Lord Almighty says. Turn from your evil ways and your shuv again. Turn from your evil ways and your evil practices, but they would not listen or pay attention to me. This is the ancestors, declares the Lord. Where are your ancestors now? Okay, where did that get them? How did that work out for you? Where are your ancestors now? And the prophets, do they live forever? But did not my words and my decrees, which I commanded my servants, the prophets, overtake your ancestors? What I said came true. It's still true, even though your ancestors are gone, even though the prophets, the original prophets, aren't here anymore. Then they repented, that is the people now, heard this, and they repented and said, The Lord Almighty has done to us what our ways and practices deserve, just as he determined to do. We got what we deserved. Right? This horror of the destruction of the city of Jerusalem and the temple, the destruction of the nation of Judah, the exile in Babylon, they now are acknowledging the fact that's what we deserve. What a vision. Yeah, that's, that's big. Continuing from there. On the 24th day of the 11th month, the month of Shabbat, in the second year of Darius, same year, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Zechariah, son of Berechiah, the son of Edu. Then the angel of the Lord said, Lord Almighty, how long will you... I, I skipped something here. Let me tell you what's going on. This is the start of the eight visions. And uh, I, I'm not dealing with all the visions because we wouldn't have time. But the, the first vision, which is uh, verses 8 to 12, Zechariah has a vision of four horses and horsemen whom God has sent out to check the whole world. And it's interesting, there, there's sort of a, a resonance with the four horsemen of the apocalypse that you get in, in uh, Revelation. But in this case, it seems, they seem peaceful. But they check the whole world. They're coming back to report back to Yahweh that the world is at peace. That's the first vision. The second vision, which is verse 18 to 21, um, deals with, which is right after this, deals with four horns. Now, a horn in the Old Testament was a symbol of power, of strength, like the horns of a bull. Okay? Um, and so the four horns represent the nations that had oppressed Israel and Judah. And it doesn't outline it, but it probably meant Egypt, who oppressed them in slavery, Assyria, uh, Babylon, and Persia. Now, Persia had been fairly nice to them, but they're still under the thumb of the Persian king, right? Um, now, 
in between those two things, we have verse 12 to 17 here. Then the angel of the Lord said, Lord Almighty, how long will you withhold mercy from Jerusalem and for the from the towns of Judah, which you have been angry with these 70 years? So the Lord spoke kind and comforting words to the angel who talked with me. Then the angel who was speaking to me said, Proclaim this word. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I am very jealous for Jerusalem and Zion, meaning I desire them so much. It's a positive thing. It's a positive use of the word jealous. And I am very angry with the nations that feel secure. I am only a little angry, but they went too far. Uh, I was only a little angry, but they went too far with the punishment. There, now you remember, what does that mean? God used Assyria to defeat the northern kingdom of, of Israel. He used Babylon to defeat the southern kingdom of Judah. The indication here is while he used them, they, they still had volition. They still had the ability to make decisions. That the king and the military, the armies, went further than God may have originally wanted. Now, God could control that, but he does give us free will. Apparently, there was free will involved in these, with the Assyrians and the Babylonians. And they did more damage to the, to the Israelites. And God is now saying, I, I'm not, I was not that mad at you, even though I was angry. Okay? Therefore, this is what the Lord says. I will return to Jerusalem with mercy. And there my house will be rebuilt. And the measuring line will be stretched out over Jerusalem, declares the Lord Almighty. Proclaim further. I think that means it will be rebuilt. The measuring line. Proclaim further. This is what the Lord Almighty says. My towns will again overflow with prosperity. And the Lord will again comfort Zion and choose Jerusalem. So God had been angry. And God had judged them. But now he's reassuring them. It's like... It's like a father who punishes a child, rightfully so, and the child, you know, comes back and says, do you not like me? And, and the parent says, of course I like you. I love you. You're going too far in, in interpreting what my punishment was. I still love you, even though I had to punish you. Um, that's what God is saying. And in fact, he's saying... I will return to Jerusalem with mercy. I will comfort my people. I re will rebuild the temple. I will rebuild the city of Jerusalem. All of this will show you that even though I had to punish you for your own fault, I still love you. I wasn't that angry. Okay? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Ron? My dad always used to say, this is going to hurt me a lot more than it hurts you. <laughs> yeah, my father never said that. <laughs> <laughs> It wasn't true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, my father was a sergeant in the military. He would never have said that. Oh. <laughs> we then have, at the start of chapter 2, let me read this, then we'll talk about it. Then I looked up, and there before me was a man with a measuring line. Remember we just said the measuring line will be stretched out of Jerusalem to rebuild it. I asked, where are you going? He answered me to measure Jerusalem to find out how wide and how long it is. While the angel was speaking to me, while the angel who was speaking to me was leaving, another angel came to meet me and said to me, Run! Tell that young man, Jerusalem will be a city without walls, because of the great number of people and animals in it. And I myself will be a wall of fire around it, declares the Lord, and I will be its glory within. Why do the ancient cities have walls? Fortified walls. For protection. So what's he saying? I'm going to protect you. You don't need walls. Now, he has said the city of Jerusalem will be rebuilt, and obviously he commissioned Nehemiah to build it. But the point he's making here is don't make the mistake of thinking you're rebuilding these walls because you're going to be like every other city, and you have to have that in order to survive. I will take care of you. <coughs> right? Come, come, flee from the land of the north, declares the Lord, for I have scattered you to the four winds of heaven, declares the Lord. Come, Zion, escape you who live in daughter of Babylon. In other words, he's calling the Jews back from wherever they are. For this is what the Lord Almighty says, After the glorious one has sent me against the nations that have plundered you, for whoever touches you touches the apple of his eye. You heard the expression, the Jews of the apple of God's eye? I will I'll surely raise my hand against them so that their slaves will plunder them. Then they will know that the Lord Almighty has sent me. Shout and to be glad, daughter Zion, for I am coming and I will live among you, declares the Lord. Many nations will be joined with the Lord in that day and will become my people. Here is the calling of all nations, not just the Jews. The thing that had been promised all along. 
I will live among you, and you will know that the Lord Almighty has sent me to you. The Lord will inherit Judah as his portion in the Holy Land, and will again choose Jerusalem. Be still before the Lord, all mankind, because he has roused himself from his holy dwelling. So, um, read Revelation 21.3, and you will hear that the final consummation, which is what's being talked about here, is... I will live in your midst, I will be your God, and you will be my people, which is the, is the summary of the covenant. I will be your God, you will be my people, I will wipe away every tear from your eyes. There will be no more suffering, or death, or mourning, or pain. You know, the, the day when God will live with us, we will be with Him. That's what's being talked about here. And anything that would oppose, or cause grief, or harm, or death, God Himself will get rid of. So Zechariah, remember, talking the future. This is the messianic <coughs> expectation. The same expectation that is talked about in Revelation as well. Okay? Um, question? Yes. Um, so he's just claiming Judah and not who were part of the northern part of Israel. Well, elsewhere he says Israel and Judah. Here he specifically is talking about Judah. And I think the reason is because Israel was horrible. I mean, they did such a horrible job. But... Um, they were so disobedient, their kings were so awful, they did not worship God ever correctly, and the southern kingdom did a better job with Josiah and Hezekiah and some of the others. But the indication is elsewhere, well, I mean, some, sometimes these passages you shorthand. You can't you can't draw too much of a conclusion by the fact he uses the word Judah and not Judah and Israel. Yeah, he's, he specifies come in verse 6, flee from the land of the north. Yeah. I, I would imagine that's an, an appeal to... Probably, and maybe the Assyrians and maybe other things, so... Mike? Um, when I read Flee from the Land of the War, I think of some of the ten lost tribes where it's the lost tribes have disappeared into, into Afghanistan. Right. Well, we to the north of Israel. Well, Assyria was to the north of Israel, and so Assyria was um, part of what we know as Iraq, but it covered over into Iran and part of Afghanistan as well, because Assyria was north of Babylon. Okay? So it may, that may have been what the reference is. But again, he does use shorthand. There are other times when he's talking about. Israel, the nation of Israel, for instance, and he says Ephraim, which was only one of the ten tribes in the north. So, you know, so there are there's shorthand in here. I think what I was trying to understand was the land volume that he was he also stating the land volume that he was going to give to them? No, again, don't don't try to draw too fine a conclusion from from these statements. I don't think in fact the original promise of the promised land that was given, you know, to the people of Israel under Moses was that it would be many times what we've ever known of as Israel. It would go from the river Euphrates to the Mediterranean Sea. It would be north of what we know of as Syria and down to the edge of Egypt. I mean, the promised land that was never completely fulfilled uh, was going to be many times larger. So we can't draw you know, specific conclusions on those kinds of things. Um, there then is a fifth, a fourth vision uh, in the first part of chapter three, which is of uh, the prophet. The, I'm sorry, the high priest Joshua being given a new set of clothes. He's wearing dirty clothes, and the, the angels appear. They take off the dirty clothes. They give him clean clothes. This is, um, and, and it says, this is a sign of the cleansing and restoration of the priests. Remember, the priests had been part of the problem. The priests and the prophets had been the ones that were taking Israel in the wrong direction. In addition to kings, but Israel meaning the whole. Israel and Judah. Um, it may also be a reference to the fact that all of the nations will be cleansed. All of the nation, rather, would be cleansed. That not just the priests, their lead, the religious leadership, but also um, the, the nation, the entire nation. The next passage um, is a vision related to the completion of the temple, in which we have some symbolism, two olive trees, which represent the two leaders of the people, Zerubbabel, the governor, and Joshua, the, um, the high priest. And the golden lampstand is probably associated or representative of the temple establishment. So let's read. Then the angel who talked with me returned and woke me up, like someone awakened from sleep. He asked me, what do you see? I answered, I see a solid gold lampstand with a bowl at the top and seven lamps on it. You get a picture of a sort of menorah kind of thing, which again, temple, uh, temple symbols with seven channels to the lamps. Also, there are two olive trees by it. That, that's, we believe, is uh, <coughs> Zerubbabel and Joshua. One on the right of the bowl and one on its left. I asked the angel who talked with me, what are these, my lord? He answered, do you not know what these are? 
No, my Lord, I replied. So he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. Recognize that? Yes. This is yes. where it's found in uh, Zechariah. What are you, mighty mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you will become level ground. Then he will bring out the capstone to shouts of God bless it, God bless it. In other words, Zerubbabel will build the temple. The capstone is the keystone that they would use on uh, arches and things. Then the word of the Lord came to me. The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this temple. His hands will also complete it. Then you will know the Lord Almighty has sent me to you. Who dares despise the day of small things? Since the seven eyes of the Lord that range throughout the earth will rejoice when they see the chosen capstone in the hand of Zerubbabel. This reference to the seven eyes of the Lord is also found in Revelation. I think it's just a symbol that says God sees everything. His eyes are everywhere. There is nothing that is outside. If you've got one eye or two eyes, there's a limit to what you can cover. But the seven eyes of the Lord see everything. Okay? Um, chapter 5 of Zechariah. I looked again, and there before me was a flying scroll. This is the sixth vision. A huge flying scroll. I say huge because it says, He asked me, what do you see? I answered, I see a flying scroll 20 cubits long and 10 cubits wide. A cubit is a foot and a half. So that means that this thing would be 30 feet long and 15 feet wide. And he said to me, this is the curse that is going out over the whole land. For according to what it says on one side, every thief will be banished. And according to what it says on the other, everyone who swears falsely will be banished. So this scroll represents the fact that God will do away with thievery and he will, he will curse or judge all those who swear falsely, especially in his name. The Lord Almighty declares, I will send it out and it will enter the house of the thief and the house of anyone who swears falsely by my name. It will remain in that house and destroy it completely, both its timbers and its stones. God will get rid of unrighteousness in the land, is what he's saying. Then the next vision, which starts here in verse 5, is of a basket with a woman in it. The woman representing iniquity. Um, and it gets carried off to Babylon. We'll talk about that in a second. Then the angel who was speaking to me came forward and said to me, Look up and see what is appearing. I asked, What is it? He replied, is it, a, it is a basket. And he added, This is the iniquity of the people throughout the land. Then the cover of lead was raised, and there in the basket sat a woman. He said, This is wickedness. And he pushed her back into the basket and pushed the lead cover down on it. Then I looked up, and there before me were two women with the wind in their wings. They had wings like those of a stork, and they lifted up the basket between heaven and earth. Where are they taking the, ba taking the basket? I asked the angel who was speaking to me. He replied, To the country of Babylon to build a house for it. When the house is ready, the basket will be set there in place. Now, there's a couple of different possible meanings for this. One is that, that iniquity will be removed from the, the presence of the people in the final day. And where else do you send it but to the people that have been your last oppressors? Babylon. Okay. There's some suggestion that this is representative of another exile that is to come for any who have iniquity, meaning any who are disobedient to God who do not worship Him correctly. And you will remember, after all, um, that there was a point at which there is another exile. The Romans uh, destroyed Jerusalem and sent the people up into exile as well in AD 70. And of course, it was between AD 70 and 1948 before the nation of Israel was reestablished. So it may be a reference to the fact that there is another exile coming if Israel is disobedient. Um, then the eighth of the eight visions, which is chapter six, the first eight verses, is of the, uh, and we believe this is a reference again to the four horses, because it's four horse-drawn chariots that are responsible to patrol the whole world and establish justice in the world in God's name. Okay? Then we get into uh, chapter uh, oops, six, verse nine. The crowning of the high priest. This is a symbol of the unification of the priesthood the high priesthood, and royalty, the king. Um, and it involves, in terms of Zerubbabel and Joshua, in terms of uh, rebuilding the temple. It's interesting to note that Jesus Christ is both priest and king, obviously, and that's, that's how he's identified in some of the liturgy. He is both priest and king. 
Um, it's also true that during the Maccabean Rebellion, one of the sons of the Maccabees, who was the king, he'd been named king, is then made high priest. And so during part of the reign of the Maccabees and the reestablishing of the, of the nation of Israel after the Seleucids, there was one person who served as both priest and king. Again, it's believed that that is a, a precursor, a presaging uh, of the eventual priest and king of Jesus. All right? The word of the Lord came to me. Take silver and gold from the exiles, Helda, Tobijah, and Jediah, who have arrived from Babylon. Go to the same day, go the same day to the house of Josiah, son of Zephaniah. Take the silver and gold and make a crown and set it on the head of the high priest, Joshua, son of Josadak. Again, this means that the high priest and the king are becoming the same. Tell him, this is what the Lord Almighty says. Here is the man whose name is the branch. And he will branch out from his place and build the temple of the Lord. It is he who will build the temple of the Lord, and he will be clothed with majesty and will sit and rule on his throne. And he will be a priest on his throne. There will be harmony between the two. So in this case, uh, uh, Josiah is, uh, or I'm sorry, Joshua is being seen as an, um, a metaphor, an image for what is to come later. Those who are far away will come and help to build the temple of the Lord. Remember what I said about Herod, who was an Idumean, who came from a different place? And you will know that the Lord Almighty has sent me to you. This will happen if you diligently obey the Lord your God. See, I read this. Those who are far away will come and help to build the temple of the Lord and think, we need some more people to move here. We have some money to help us build our church. Um, again, this is a messianic expectation. It talks about... Uh, he who will build the temple of the Lord, the ultimate temple of the Lord, I think it means, that, that far view, uh, not yet, will be clothed with majesty, will sit on the throne, and he will be priest on the throne, a harmony between the two. Okay? And yet, Zechariah, again, he's talking about the future and restoration, but he does have some, uh, some stern words, and particularly with regard to ritual not being enough, that justice must be done. Right? That you must care for the needs of those who are weak. In the fourth year, now this is two years later, this is in 518 B.C. In the fourth year of King Darius, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah on the fourth day of the ninth month, the month of Kislev. Then the word of the Lord Almighty came to me, ask all the people of the land and the priests. When you fasted and mourned in the fifth and seventh months, by the way, they had come to God and said, okay, should we still be fasting in the fifth and seventh months? I cut that part out because you can't get it all on here. Um, when you fasted and mourned in the fifth and seventh months for the past 70 years, was it really for me that you fasted? And when you were eating and drinking, were you not just feasting for yourselves? And the word of the Lord came again to Zechariah. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Administer true justice. Show mercy and compassion to one another. Do not oppress the widow or the fatherless, the foreigner or the poor. Do not plot evil against each other. But they refused to pay attention. Stubbornly they turned their backs and covered their ears. They made their hearts as hard as flint and would not listen to the law or the words of the Lord Almighty, the words that the Lord Almighty had sent by His Spirit through the earlier prophets. So the Lord Almighty was angry. Very angry. When I called, they did not listen. So when they called, I would not listen, said the Lord Almighty. Write that one down. <laughs> People who say, I prayed and God didn't, hear, God didn't answer. When I called, they did not listen. So when they called, I would not listen, said the Lord Almighty. Sounds fair to me. <clears throat> I scattered them with a whirlwind among all the eight nations where they were strangers. The land they left behind them was so desolate that no one traveled through it. This is how they made the pleasant land desolate. So in this case, this is a vision that comes to uh, Zechariah to share. But it's a flashback to how the people did act. God was very clear then, and it's being told now because this was still an issue in Zechariah's time, it's an issue today, that rather than be concerned about, okay, how much do we need to fast, fifth and seventh month, twice a week, uh, what, what rituals do we have to do, is this okay for sacrifice, and do I need to, do I have to, do I have to give, uh, do I have to tithe based on my gross or my net? Okay, that's, that's the same question, all right? Um, and I've had that question asked to me before in classes. Um, and the answer, the only good answer is, well, do you want to be blessed on your gross or your net? Yes. <laughs> it's the wrong question because the question implies that I want to get away with as little as I can. 
terms of service to God. All right? This is exactly the kind of thing they're talking about here. And God says, instead of worrying about what you can get away with in terms of uh, religious practices, think about justice. Administer justice. Care about the people who have needs. Show compassion to each other. The widow, the fatherless, the foreigner, the poor, if you're taking care of them, then you're probably going to be thinking differently about all those questions you're asking. Okay with that? You're going to stop me if you have questions, because I'm going to keep moving here. Zechariah 8, we now get a picture in the first, in, in the first 23 verses, which we'll look at at 17 of them here, of chapter 8, of the future restoration. The word of the Lord Almighty came to me. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I am very jealous for Zion. Zion represents Jerusalem and Israel. And jealous here is means I desire to be in a relationship with it. It's a positive thing. I am burning with jealousy for her. This is what the Lord says. I will return to Zion and dwell in Jerusalem. Then Jerusalem will be called the faithful city, and the mountain of the Lord Almighty will be called the holy mountain. You know Jerusalem is built on a mountain. Okay. In fact, it's, um, it's the reason that when the Jebusites held it, it was never conquered during the time of the conquering of the land. It wasn't until David came later that he succeeded um, doing it. If you ever see the topography of of the city, what's called the city of David is not where where the temple was. The city of David is a lower area, which which uh, is where the original Jebusite city was, and it's what David conquered. It's where he built David's <laughs> citadel. Up from that, the next level up is where later on they built the Temple uh, Mount, and that's where Al Aqsa Mosque and the Dome of the Rock are now. And then. Actually, Zion Hill is the next level up from that, which is just west of what the original city of David was. Um, someday maybe I'll bring it up. It's all the same structure? The, the thing to the west is, is on the No, I, the these were built in different times. I mean, in fact, I mean is, is the thing on the west still the same mount? Yes. I mean, it's all, it's all, it's all one mount. They're different levels. And there are, there are small valleys that run in between these different sections. You know, there's the, the uh, Kidron Valley, which run, which is off the mountain on the, the uh, east side. There's the Valley of Hinnom, which is on the west side. There's actually a transverse valley that goes behind uh, parts of the city. So it's in different levels, but it's all, you know, it's all but, elevated. But there's a section higher than the temple. Yes. Wow. Yeah. In fact, uh, yeah, more than one, actually. Um, there's, there's a... Behind where the Temple Mount was, there's the Transverse Valley. It drops off, but then it elevates beyond that again. So the idea is when they talk about the Holy Mountain, Jerusalem really was built on a mountain, uh, not a mountain like, you know, not the, not like uh, Kilimanjaro or something, but you know, a mount. So it was a fortified city. This is what the Lord Almighty says: Once again, men and women of ripe old age will sit in the streets of Jerusalem, each of them with cane in hand because of their age. The city streets will be filled with boys and girls playing there. A sense of peace. This is what the Lord Almighty says. It may seem marvelous to the remnant of this people at this time, at that time, but it will seem but will it seem marvelous to me, declares the Lord Almighty? This is what the Lord Almighty says. And, and when he says, Will it be marvelous to me? He said, I can make this happen without it being mysterious to me. Okay. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I will save my people from the countries of the east and the west. I will bring them back to live in Jerusalem. They will be my people, and I will be faithful and righteous to them as their God. This idea of return, of restoration. And you remember that to the Jews, the definition of salvation is return from exile. And that's why you get promises like this. Okay? And then it continues. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Now hear these words. Let your hands be strong so that the temple may be built. Zechariah also talks about finishing the temple. This is also what the prophets said who were present when the foundation was laid for the house of the Lord Almighty. Before that time, there were no wages for people or hire for animals. No one could go about their business safely because of their enemies, since I had turned everyone against their neighbor. But now I will not deal with the remnant of this people as I did in the past, declares the Lord Almighty. Okay, the idea is, okay, we don't have enough, so give us more God, and then we'll... Well, before that time, there were no wages for people or hire for animals. Before they committed to build the temple, in other words, they didn't have excess. They didn't have enough until they committed to do it, and then they had enough. All right? The seed will grow well, the vine will yield its fruit, the ground will produce its crop. This means once they've committed to, to build this house. 
and the heavens will drop their dew. I will give all these things as an inheritance to the remnant of this people. Just as you, Judah and Israel, have been a curse among the nations, so I will save you and you will be a blessing. Do not be afraid, but let your hands be strong. I think when it says you've been a curse among the nations, there's never been a people that was dis as despised or as persecuted as the Jewish people. Okay. From the most ancient of times up until today. And they will no longer be seen as a curse, but rather a blessing. This is what the Lord Almighty says, Just as I had determined to bring disaster on you and show no pity when your ancestors angered me, said the Lord Almighty, so now I have determined to do good again to Jerusalem and Judah. Do not be afraid. These are the things you are to do. Speak the truth to each other and render true and sound judgment in your courts. Do not plot evil against each other. Do not love to swear falsely. I hate all this, declares the Lord. So God has promised he will restore and he will make whole. And he says, but you do have responsibilities. Don't forget, there are right ways and wrong ways to act before me. So don't be afraid, but make sure you act right. And it's the old thing about don't, don't try to do good so that you can be saved. So that, do not, don't try to do good so that God will save you. Allow God to save you so that you then can be good. That's very much the order we're talking about. And then chapter 9, beginning with the ninth verse, the first eight verses of chapter 9 are judgments against the nations, like the oracles against the nations that we have in the major prophets and elsewhere. Okay? And then the coming of the righteous messianic king. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a coal, the foal of a donkey. Does that sound familiar? This is the Messianic prophecy fulfilled when Jesus entered Jerusalem before Passion Week on, uh, on Palm Sunday. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. No more war. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. As for you, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will free your prisoners from the waterless pit. Return to your fortress, you prisoners of hope. Even now I announce that I will restore twice as much to you. I will bend to Judah as I bend my bow and fill it with Ephraim. Ephraim is, is, means Israel, the northern kingdom of Israel. Okay. I will rouse your sons, Zion, against your sons, Greece, and make you like a warrior's sword. This is one of the things that uh, liberal scholars say... Prophet Zechariah couldn't have written this in 520 B.C. because we believe this reference, I will rouse your sons Zion against your sons Greece, is a prophetic reference to the Maccabean Rebellion, where they were being controlled by the Seleucids, which were Greeks. Uh, Seleucus having been one of the generals, junior generals actually, under uh, Alexander, the Seleucid Empire was controlling Israel, and it was against that Greek Seleucid Empire that the uh, Maccabean Jews rebelled. And so the belief, I will rouse your son Zion against your son's Greece, is a reference to that Maccabean rebellion. Verse 14. Then the Lord will appear over them. His arrow will flash like lightning. The sovereign Lord will sound the trumpet. He will march in the storms of the south, and the Lord Almighty will shield them. They will destroy and overcome with sling stones. They will drink and roar as with wine. They will be full like a bowl used for sprinkling the corners of the altar. The Lord their God will save his people on that day as a shepherd saves his flock. The idea being that God will, in the last day, the day of the Lord, there will be judgment. God will himself fight the battle. I'm moving forward here because I'm running out of time. Zechariah 10. I've only got a couple more uh, from Zechariah. I will strengthen Judah and save the tribes of Joseph. I will restore them because I have compassion on them. The tribes of Joseph uh, would be Manasseh and Ephraim. Okay, those were the two sons of Joseph who were each given a share, since the Levites weren't given a share. So that's talking about the northern kingdom. Um, I will strengthen Judah and save the tribes of Joseph. I will restore them because I have compassion on them. They will be as though I had not rejected them, for I am the Lord their God, and I will answer them. The Ephraimites will become like warriors. Their hearts will be glad as with wine. Their children will see it and be joyful. Their hearts will rejoice in the Lord. Slipping down here, verse 9. Though I scattered them among the peoples, yet in distant lands they will remember me. 
they and their children will survive and they will return. There is the promise of return. Salvation to the Jews. Return from exile. I will bring them to, uh, back from Egypt and gather them from Assyria. I will bring them to Gilead and Lebanon. There will be not, not enough room for them. They will pass through the sea of trouble. The surging sea will be subdued and all the depths of the Nile will dry up. I will strengthen them in the Lord and in his name they will live securely, declares the Lord. Okay, so this restoration and return. Um, this passage is about judgment, about the fact that um, God will break. It talks about having two staffs, one called favor and one called union. And when the people re reject him as shepherd or reject his shepherd, he will break them apart. And in fact, the interesting part of this, verse 16 says, For I am going to raise up a shepherd over the land who will not care for the lost, or seek the young, or heal the injured, or feed the healthy, or eat the meat or the choice of the choice sheep, tearing off their, but will eat the meat of the choice sheep, tearing off their hooves. Um, remember the situation that Jesus was confronted with when he, when he came? What was, you know, what was the Sanhedrin like? What were the priests like? What were the Pharisees like? They were not caring about the people. They laid the burden of the law on them instead of caring about them. And that's what Jesus condemned them for. You don't care about the people. You don't have to lift their burden. You put burdens on them. Well, I think this description is a prophetic statement about what would happen if the Israelites were disobedient. And it would end up with the kind of religious structure that you had when Jesus came. Then we get references to the coming of the Messiah. I've got way more stuff here than I should have. On that day, this is the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord which is both judgment and restoration. On that day, a fountain will be opened to the house of David, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, to cleanse them from sin and impurity. All right, the living water. Sound familiar? On that day, I will banish the name of the idols from the land. They will be remembered no more, declares the Lord Almighty, and I will rem remove both the prophets and the spirit of impurity from the land. It goes on to say that anybody who prophesies will be stabbed by their own family, and uh, they'll bear scars if they try. And the idea behind that, I believe, is twofold. One, false prophets, which there were a lot of in the history of Israel. But I think part of it is it's saying, in that day there will be no need for prophets, because God himself will be speaking to us. And so prophecy will no longer be something that's required. Forgive me skipping over some of this stuff, but you've read this already, I know. So, um, Zechariah 13, verse 7. Awake, sword, against my shepherd, against the man who is close to me, declares the Lord Almighty. Strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered, and I will turn my hand against the little ones. Recognize that? Outside the Garden of Gethsemane, when Jesus is arrested, they quote that. Strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. Jesus orders his disciples, followers, you know, don't stay here, go. In the whole land, declares the Lord, two-thirds will be struck down and perish, yet one-third will be left in it. The third I will put into the fire. I will refine them like silver and test them like gold. And here's the ultimate clause of covenant. They will call on my name and I will answer them. I will say, they are my people. And they will say, the Lord is our God. I will be your God and you will be my people. That is the, the summary of what the covenant God had with the Israelites is. One more Zechariah passage. Two more Zechariah passages. Mm -hmm. A day of the Lord is coming. Remember, the day of the Lord is both judgment and restoration. Jerusalem, when your possessions will be plundered and divided up within your walls, I will gather all the nations to Jerusalem to fight against it. The city will be captured, the houses ransacked, and the women raped. Half of the city will go into exile, but the rest of the people will be, uh, not be taken from the city. So, devastation is coming. Still, there is still judgment to happen. Then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as he fights on the day of battle. On that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives east of Jerusalem, and the, and the Mount of Olives will be split in two from east to west, forming a great valley with half the mountain moving north and half moving south. Of course, the, the Mount of Olives, just across the Kidron Valley, overlooks the city of Jerusalem. So it's right, you know, if you've got a good arm, you can probably throw a baseball from Mount of Olives you know, to, the, to the city. Um, you will flee by my mountain valley, for it will extend to Azel. You will flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Then the Lord my God will come, and all the holiness, holy ones come with him. What does that sound like? The Lord my God will come, and all his holy ones will come with him. On that day, there will be the 
I think the return of Jesus, you know, the final consummation, coming in the clouds. On that day there will be neither sunshine, sunlight nor cold, frosty darkness. It will be a unique day, a day known only to the Lord. Remember Jesus said, even I don't know what day, only the Father in heaven knows. With no distinction between day and night, when evening comes there will be light. On that day, living water will flow out from Jerusalem, half of it east to the Dead Sea and half of it west to the Mediterranean Sea. In summer and in winter, the Lord will be king over the whole earth. On that day, there will be one Lord and his name, the only name. You see the messianic references here very clearly. Okay, one more Zechariah passage. I just love this stuff too much to skip it all. <clears throat> then the survivors from all the nations, here's where the Gentiles, where we get to pitch in. The survivors from all the nations that have attacked Jerusalem will go up year after year to worship the King, the Lord Almighty, and to celebrate the Festival of Tabernacles. So all peoples, even those that attacked Jerusalem, will turn to the Lord. If any of the peoples of the earth do not go up to Jerusalem to worship the King, the Lord Almighty, they will have no rain. Again, there's, there's downsides to not obeying God and worshiping Him. If the Egyptian people do not go up and take part, they will have no rain. The Lord will bring on them the plague He inflicts on the nations that do not go up to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. This will be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all the nations that do not go up to celebrate the Festival of Tab Tabernacles. On that day, holy to the Lord will be inscribed on the bells of the horses, and the cooking pots in the Lord's house will be like the sacred bowls in front of the altar. Every pot in Jerusalem and Judah will be holy to the Lord Almighty. To all who come to sacrifice, will, uh, and all who come to sacrifice will take some of the pots and cook in them, and on that day there will no longer be a Canaanite in the house of the Lord Almighty. That's all that means. I think it's saying, at that point, there will no longer be uh, religious and secular. There will no longer be holy and, and uh, unholy. Everything will be the Lord's. Everything will be committed to the Lord. It will be entirely His. And even the pots will be inscribed as being dedicated to the Lord, meaning they will be uh, made holy and clean. Nothing else... Nothing will be secular or defiled or common uh, anymore. It will all be to God. When it says there will no longer be a Canaanite in the house of the Lord Almighty, I think that means nobody will be a stranger. Nobody will be a foreigner. Everyone will belong there. Because the Canaanites were seen as, that word means foreigner to the Israelites. That was the people, they went in and had, you know, had to try to displace. All right. Let's talk about Malachi. Malachi. Um, it's only four chapters, we can do it quick. Malachi literally means my messenger. That's what the name Malachi means. And it either is his name or it's his title, and we're not sure which. There is no historical superscription here, uh, no dates given, no kings mentioned, but it's very clear this is post exilic by the content. Um, and it's interesting that whereas the Minor Prophets, the Book of the Twelve, opened in Hosea 1 to 3 with statements about, I have loved you, says Yahweh, Malachi ends with the same message, I have loved you. So it bookends the whole books, uh, 12 books of the Minor Prophets. I have loved you, says Messiah, says Yahweh, I have, uh, in Hosea, I have loved you, says Yahweh, in Malachi. We believe around 450 BC, the fact that God continues to love despite Israel's lethargy and backsliding, um, and the interesting thing here is some of the issues that Malachi addresses with the Jewish people in terms of some of the faults they were beginning to develop, we see this as the start of some of the Pharisaical problems that, and, the, and the Sadducee problems as well, some of the Sanhedrin, some of the, the falseness of the Jewish religion in Jesus' time. We see the seeds of that right here in Malachi. He's addressing some of those same concerns where there are more political interests than religious interests, where there's a desire for following the, the letter of the law and not the spirit of the law, that kind of thing. Okay? Um, as a son honors his father, starting with verse 6, it, it starts out you know, with the call of Malachi. As a son honor, honors his father and a slave is master, if I am a father, where is the honor due me? If I'm a master, where is the respect due me, says the Lord Almighty. What he's saying here is, you're not treating me, God, as well as you treat your earthly superiors, sons to their fathers, slaves to their masters. Is it you priests who show con it is you priests who show contempt for my name, and you ask, uh, how have we shown contempt for your name by offering defiled food on my altar? But you ask, how have we defiled you by saying that the Lord's table is contemptible? When you offer blind animals for sacrifice, is that not wrong? In other words, they're looking for ways 
shortcuts so they can keep the best stuff for themselves. God is getting second best. When you sacrifice lame or diseased animals, is that not wrong? Try offering them to your governor, meaning your local human authority. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you, says the Lord Almighty? Now plead with God to be gracious to us. With such offerings from your hands, will he accept you, says the Lord Almighty? In other words, they were trying to do the ritualistic things, but they were trying to do shortcuts so they could keep more for themselves, rather than doing it because they love God. This sort of, you know, letter of the law, but not spirit of the law. Kind of thing. Continuing. Oh, that one of you would shut the temple door so that you would not light useless fires on my altar. I am not pleased with you, said the Lord Almighty, and I will accept no offering from your hands. My name will be great among the nations from where the sun rises to where it sets. In every place, incense and pure offerings will be brought to me because my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord Almighty. He's saying, you're treating me like it doesn't matter. And you need to know that every nation on earth will come to recognize that I'm the Lord Almighty and they will honor me even though you're not and you have been my chosen people. But you profane it by saying the Lord's table is defiled and its food is contemptible and you say, what a burden, and you <coughs> sniff at it contemptuously, says the Lord Almighty. When you bring injured, lame, or diseased animals and offer them as sacrifices, should I accept them from your hands, says the Lord? Cursed is the cheat who has an acceptable male in his flock and vows to give it but then sacrifices a blemished animal to the Lord. For I am a great king, says the Lord Almighty, and my name is to be feared among the nations. All right. Um, chapter 2. Do we not all have one father? Did not one God create us? Why do we profane the covenant of our ancestors by being unfaithful to one another? We also have an obligation to righteousness to each other. Another thing you do, you flood the Lord's altar with tears. You weep and wail because he no longer looks with favor on your offerings or accepts them with pleasure from your hands. You ask, why? It is because the Lord is the witness between you and the wife of your youth. You have been unfaithful to her, though she is your partner, the wife of your marriage covenant. Okay, right here Malachi stops preaching and goes to meddling. He starts saying, if you're unfaithful to your spouse, if you divorce your spouse... You offend God. Has not the one God made you? You belong to him in body and spirit. And what does the one God seek? Godly offspring. So be on your guard and do not be unfaithful to the wife of your youth. The man who hates and divorces his wife, says the Lord, the God of Israel, does violence to the one he should protect, says the Lord Almighty. So be on your guard and do not be unfaithful. You have wearied the Lord with your words. How have we wearied him, you ask? By saying, all who do evil are good in the eyes of the Lord, and is, he is pleased with them, or where is the God of justice? In other words, by trying to make excuses and say, oh, that's okay, you're all right. Don't, that's fine, you, you'll be okay. Or, God's not here, he's not listening, he's not paying attention, you can go ahead, he's not going to do anything. I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me, then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come. Okay, don't think God's not here, or he won't be here. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap, which back then they used things like lye. All right, which strong stuff. For he will... Um, he will Sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the Levites and refine them like gold and silver. Then the Lord will have men who will bring offerings in righteousness. And the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem will be, will be acceptable to the Lord as in days gone by, as in former years. You get this idea that some of the same problems that Jesus confronted and accused the religious authorities and teachers of the law and Pharisees of his day, starting here in Malachi, 450 years earlier. So I will come to put you on trial. I will be quick to testify against sorcerers, adulterers, and perjurers, against those who defraud laborers of their wages, who oppress the widows and the fatherless, here's the justice theme again, and deprive the foreigners among you of justice. But do not fear me, says the Lord Almighty. 
I, the Lord, do not change, so you, the descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Ever since the time of your ancestors, you have turned away from my decrees. What that means is, I promised you, and I don't change. I don't break my covenant with you. And so that's the only reason you're still around. <clears throat> Ever since the time of your ancestors, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you. Shuv. Repent. Turn and come back to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. But you ask, how are we to return? Will a mere mortal rob God, yet you rob me? But you ask, how are we robbing you? You know, the innocent thing is not working very well. In tithes and offerings, you are under a curse, your whole nation, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there will be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. This issue of, well, don't we have to have a lot more before we can give? I will prevent pests from devouring your crops, and the vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it is ripe, says the Lord Almighty. Then all the nations will call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. Step up. Give to God, God says, and I will bless you. You have spoken arrogantly against me, says the Lord, yet you ask, what have we said against you? You have said it is futile to serve God. What do we gain by carrying out his requirements and going about like mourners before the Lord Almighty? But now we call the arrogant blessed. This idea that we want somebody to tell us we're okay when we sin, when we reject God, when we're arrogant. Certainly evildoers prosper, and even when they put God to the test, they get away with it. Then those who feared the Lord talked with each other, and the Lord listened and heard. A scroll of remembrance was written in His presence concerning those who feared the Lord and honored His name. God knows who is seeking after Him and wants to do the right thing. On the day when I act, says the Lord Almighty, they will be my treasured possession. I will spare them just... Thought I moved it. I will spare them just as the Father has compassion and spares his Son who serves him, and you will again see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve God and those who do not. There's going to be a divide. There's going to be a point at which God says, That's enough, and he draws a line, and we're going to be on one side or the other, depending upon how we've responded to him. And the last slide, Malachi 4. Surely the day is coming, again, the day of the Lord, the day of both judgment and restoration. It will burn like a furnace. All the arrogant and every evildoer will be stubble, and the day that is coming will set them on fire, says the Lord Almighty. There is blessing for the righteous. There is fire for the wicked. Not a root or a branch will be left to them. But for you who revere my name, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its rays, and you will go out and frolic like well-fed calves. Isn't that a great image? <laughs> we will go out and frolic like well-fed calves. Then you will trample on the wicked. They will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I act, says the Lord Almighty. Remember the law of my servant Moses, the decrees and laws I gave him in Horeb for all Israel. See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you. Remember, they expect Elijah to come back. Before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes, he will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents, or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction. Observant Jews believe Elijah will come back, and he will come back as a precursor before the final day of the Lord, which will be both judgment on the wicked and a blessing on the righteous. Our belief is that, that the return of Elijah was uh, John the Baptist, who told of the coming of the Messiah Jesus. He was the forerunner before Jesus, and fulfilled this, these prophecies about the coming of Elijah. Okay, I only went a minute and a half over. Any questions about any of that, or all of that, or Something else. Joanne? Yeah, you know, you say that um, some of the people believe that part of it wasn't written because it first to believe. But they're prophets, God can tell them anything. Well, but people, people don't believe that. See, that we say it's prophets. We believe that, that when God spoke to the prophets, some of what he told them was a prediction of something to come. Just like Isaiah. Some people believe Isaiah could not all have been written by the prophet Isaiah because he mentions Cyrus, the, the Persian king, by name later on in Isaiah. So liberal scholars say that there's at least two Isaiahs. They talk about Isaiah 1 and Isaiah 2. 
The same thing, some people say Zechariah had to be written by multiple people because he couldn't have mentioned, he couldn't have said something about the Greeks oppressing the, the Jews since that happened a lot later. Well, we believe that God spoke prophetic truths that were in advance of the actual events and that that doesn't mean, you know, the fact that it's there doesn't mean that they can't be real. So they are the conservative scholars. Versus liberal, liberal scholars. scholars. Okay. Yep. And I am, a more, I am a conservative scholar. I believe God can do whatever he wants. That's right. All right, thank you, folks.